Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of History After Hours. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and with me like normal is Mr. Ron Franklin and Mr. Jeremy Nixon. We are three history teachers from Lakeside High School in beautiful Hot Springs, Arkansas. And this podcast is where we kind of look at life through a lens of history. Uh, Today's date is Thursday, December 2nd, 2021, and this is kind of like the wrap-up podcast for the year. We look a little bit at how different politics are now compared to last year, and then we get into a few holiday favorites. So, with that being said, we hope you enjoy this podcast. All right, it is Thursday, what is it, December 2nd? Number two. 2021. How are you doing? I'm I'm, (laughs) I'm looking forward to the next two Mondays. That's it. We're on the downhill slide. This is the best thing about being a teacher is after that short break called Thanksgiving break, the long break is coming. It's kind of like spring break is over and the summer break is coming and teachers are more excited than the kids. How do you feel about the fact that we've gone to a, a full week for Thanksgiving instead of this the two-day, hey... I feel great about it. Do you? <laughs> I feel great about it. I well, don't know that it's necessarily the best for the kids, but... Well, I mean, it, it's going to keep pushing us closer to going into June, and that bothers me for some... Yeah. It bothers yeah, me more well, to go into June than it does to... We're going to do that anyway with oh, that. Oh, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, New but, law. But if we didn't have a full week at Thanksgiving... Yeah. Well, in the, Less than that likelihood. Yeah. Here I am complaining about days off. Listen to me. What kind of first world problem do I have? <laughs> well, I've been talking when about... When do you want your days off, Ron? <laughs> I know. Well, take them all together, please. <laughs> I was talking about public education and like how we let kids out so they can go uh, you know, plant their crops, then they work the crops, then they harvest the crops, and they come back to school. I mean, that's how our school was designed. And a lot of mm-hmm. them didn't know that, that yep. that's why we yep. have a summer break. And we got some kids that are farmers, don't you think? I mean, not traditional but, crops. Right, yeah. I mean, like, I was a farmer, but we had cows, so <laughs> cows don't just milk in the summer. But, yeah, agricultural I mean, crop. recreational marijuana is coming, and I assume yeah, there are going to be some I people who are more interested in agriculture than they used to be. So. It's more of a re- year-round crop at this point. Agricultural <laughs> revolution? Hmm. <laughs> Ooh. They probably got greenhouses doing all this madness. The natural state, bro. <laughs> I know That's a few true. Supreme Court cases where they grew it in the attic with grow lights. I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Hey, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're at the end. We we were kind of talking before we started recording about how different, you know, we're nearing the first year of Biden's presidency, and a lot of the, what we talk about on this podcast is politics and how just different the vibe is with Biden than Trump. And maybe that's on us because we just because I just unplugged went once Trump lost, and you didn't have those breaking news. We're all gonna die. Um, not to say it was. 100% his fault, but he's just so polarizing. Uh, Biden is more apathetic, I guess. I'm just apathetic to the whole situation now, where when Trump was president, I was much more excitable, I think. Mm-hmm. I was tuning in to see what was next. And with Biden, I'm just kind of apathetic, I guess. What's your take on... I'm affected differently, yeah, for sure. I remember the during the, 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 the Trump years, years, the Trump years, where you turn on some station and be like, the guy having a panic attack. This is in breaking news. Trump is still president. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. What, 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 what calamity has come out of his mouth today? It's, hey, but he, you know, I think he worked hard at being that guy, you yeah. know, to make mm-hmm. us all irritable so that he could... Ratings. Wor- Ratings. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I really think that's part of it. Look at how many people I got to watch me. That's his, that was his M.O., but I'm I'm very much happy that I don't have to see Joe Biden's face on my TV 24 hours a day or any president's face. Honestly, it, it, it not. You know, but Trump was there all the time. You couldn't you couldn't escape him seemingly. Whereas now I'll go weeks without even thinking about Joe Biden, which yeah. may not be a great thing either. I, honestly, I don't get to do that. Well, I have you're, to, yeah, but you're the gov. <laughs> I'm guy. the gov politics oh, yeah. guy. I have Sorry. To, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm but it's still not like. In. But even when I'm not thinking about it, he's not looming in the back of my mind, going, "What the hell is he doing today? That's right. going to cause some problem, you know, with us, yeah. our allies, with our economy, with." Health services, whatever. I ch- I check in on the news and I'm like, oh, yep, steady, steady as we go. Whether that's good or bad, it's mm-hmm. it's so much more. Um, 
Stable. Predictable. Uh, yeah, predictable. Um, so, I mean, it's not that we talk about the government every day in government, and that includes Joe Biden and the Congress and what they're doing or what they're not doing, but there is a different sense of, of or lack of urgency <laughs> when we're talking about it. It is just a slower pace. And I don't have to say anymore, well, knock on wood, uh, I don't have to say Typically, the mm-hmm. president <laughs> and right. fill in the blank for good or bad. We're back to right. typical. We're back. We're back to typical. And in some ways, that's not good. But it is very much a routine presidency. But it hasn't it helped your peace of mind to not oh, be yes. badgered and bludgeoned with you know. Yes. Oh, just every and day. And some of that goes like to a, the news. Some of that obviously sure. well, is. Yeah. They were using Trump for ratings, and they're all suffering now. Yep. They are. Just like yeah. we're not watching because, you know, it's more calm. They, they can't make it a sport. What have, they, what have they supplanted him with, you think? Is there anything that they've, that they've taken? No, they're still talking about it. The fun as much outrage as of the week is... The fun outrage of the week. Oh, that's, yeah, okay. What is it? Let's, let's make that a segment on here now. <laughs> is that Kamala Harris spent $400 on copper pots in Paris. Uh, and that's How a cr- dare and that's a crime she, in because... this horrible economy. She's lost touch no. with average Americans. Oh, I... so, so wait a minute. I, wait a minute. Wait. So you're telling me people with money shouldn't spend it? Uh, How well, is that going to affect the economy? Oh, is it just because she spent it in France and not here? Yeah, possibly. Even uh, though if you buy stuff here, it didn't come from here. It came from China? Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, hmm. You know, it's it's the idea that Americans are suffering and, and she's buying for Are they trying to make her pots. a Marie Antoinette? I Kind of, yeah. Wow. I thought, whoa, the irony of that after the previous administration. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, with her jacket with I don't care, how about you kind of s- slogans on the back or whatever. I, yeah, or just, just throw the White paper House. towel at people who are drowning in Puerto Rico, you know? I mean, yeah. that that's so, so much sensitivity there, right? It is amazing how much the late night talk show host and the news still tries to talk about Trump. They 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 yes. want to talk about Trump. There's a segment on Trump today, I'm sure, right now running that he's done this or the QAnon folks are waiting for JFK Jr. or I whatever. They go back to telling just regular jokes. Like late night people, I know you served a purpose at, at but go back let let yeah. SNL do your the, the political satire. Like go back to telling regular jokes if you can. Yeah, we get your you point know? of view. The, we see the jokes yeah. coming. Let's I move mean, on. Come on. Not everybody needs to be Stephen Colbert and you know John Stewart. Go. I do think, by the way, Trump getting kicked off of a lot of social media was the best thing that could have happened for him because his popularity has been climbing, which naturally happens when the opposing uh, party is in office. But he doesn't get a chance to turn off a lot of people. And there's a lot of people that are in the middle that say, you know, Trump wasn't that bad mm-hmm. because they don't get to hear the craziness every day in Twitter and Facebook. They don't get to hear some of those outrageous statements. I think him being kicked off and being quieted in that way was probably really helping him. It is helping him. Yeah, it will benefit him politically. Mm-hmm. Mm. The political outrage of the week. How did you say it? No, the fun. What did you say? I don't even remember now. I'll have to go back and listen to this. The f- the fun, outrageous thing of the week. Yeah. Ah, that's just. Yeah, they're looking for something. They are. They're digging yes. for something to to sound controversial. It was headline on Fox and the, on online and TV. Breaking news: Joe yes. Biden still breathing. What an outrage! Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is he okay? How about this? What do you guys think about him? He says he's going to run again. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, maybe predictable, maybe not. Um, well, I thought he. Wait a minute. I thought he said that he wouldn't. He had heavily alluded on the campaign trail that it would he would be a one. So now term. he's saying, "See, this is how unplugged I am from the Biden administration." I'm just. Yeah, I've heard. And not that, I, not that I think that everything they're doing is great. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. I just don't think that everything they're doing is inflammatory, and so therefore I'm not as paying. Yeah, I'm not, not paying, paying as much as, attention yeah. to it. So I didn't know about the uh, Kamala Harris thing. I didn't know about the. When did he say this that he's going oh, to? Probably there was run an again. interview a few weeks back that he gave that indicated, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but something at something like at this point he he foresees himself being on the ticket hmm. at a pretty advanced age, right? Uh, very, yeah, in his eighties, yeah. Mm-hmm. So at that point, and and look, this the you know the the Democrats are already figuring out who they want to run or were figuring out who they wanted to run because they thought he might not mm-hmm. run again. Mm-hmm. Um, there were, you know, there are always, there are always political rumors. That, that you said heavily of, alluded. I thought he actually came right out and said it. Did he not? Uh, well, so I, I don't remember the, his exact wording, but 
I think it was I expect to be or I expect, you know. No, no, I mean like before when he when that was part of the campaign. Before. He didn't come out and say I wouldn't, but he, you know. Yeah, he, there was some messaging that yes, was okay. basically. I just, it seemed like it be, was a heavy inference. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think it was a heavy inference. Oh no, I, I remember right. having that understanding too. Um, Which that's a great political strategy. Sure, is I'm just going to uh, James K. Polk did it. I'm going to run one term. I won't run for re-election. Elect me. That's been done before, um, and it made sense with him because he was once he got the nomination, he was you know he is old, the oldest president, and so that kind of put people's well. He's just going to be there for years, and then we get somebody else. We just got to get Trump out of office. That was the mindset of the Democrats. Um, but now, yeah, I wonder if a lot of the Democrats are like, oh. Please don't. Well, there's <laughs> they're split, right? Mm. Yeah. Well, and there there's there is gossip out of the vice president's office that she doesn't feel she is being groomed with enough responsibility to take over and run if he doesn't, or if something should happen to him, and that that actually it's transportation secretary Pete Buttigieg that's being sort of all right. So how do you how would that normally take? If you were going, if you were president, going to groom a vice president to take your spot when you were gone, uh, Reagan Bush. Yeah. What? How do you go? What would be the typical scenario? Because I don't know. Like, would you say, okay, join me in this meeting and help me make mm-hmm. these decisions with this phone call with this particular leader? And yeah, but she's not give. She's not being given those. I wonder how much of that, like when when it was Obama and Biden. I wonder how much of that was a partnership, really, and and they're not having that seemingly here. Yeah, I mean, I. From everything that I've seen, Obama and Biden did have a a fairly decent partnership. Um, Joe Biden was the insider. Like, he was the guy who helped Obama around the Hill, um, and he was the guy who helped him with foreign policy. So, because Barack Obama, when he became president, he was still still in his first term as senator. So, Biden was, in in a weird way, a mentor as vice president. Mm -hmm. Um, Harris is not, and so he has so much experience as or just in the government that I don't think he needs her in the way that Obama needed him. Um, and okay. But so that my next question is how much grooming does she need? Yeah. And I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you look kind of at presidential campaigns and hers had a her lot of buzz ex- at the her, beginning. Her, her professional experience in all these different avenues of her life, you would go, heck, she could probably just take, take the reins and run right. without much help from him. To prepare her for whatever you know. What, what I mean? worried the Democrats was that her presidential campaign did not take off. Oh, um, and and I think that that's where they're wanting Biden to help on mm. you know image electability and look some of that sexism, some of it's racism, and you know it's it's hard to groom someone for office and and make them into a likable candidate. Hillary Clinton was never liked. But mm-hmm. she was probably one of the most qualified people to ever run. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, she reminds me a little bit of Hillary in that way, is that she just does not come off likable. She does she doesn't feel very inspiring when she speaks for whatever reason. Um, I don't know, just that vibe. And so, yeah, I think they want some more excitability. Um, are we going to skip a generation for president? Like go from a baby boomer to a millennial? Is that what? <laughs> how many people have? Oh, how oh. many? How many uh, senior Congress people? Have suddenly within the past year or so said, "Yeah, I'm not coming back." And there's there's been at least like what four or five, maybe there more? have been a few. Um, a lot of the Republicans, I'm like the old uh, school. Well, I mean, Grassley's still running, and he's yeah. in his nineties. Oh, so, so, for some yeah. reason, I was thinking he was going too. No, okay. bless. Well. He's. <laughs> I mean, at some point, all right. What do you think about term limits? I th- and I'm not trying to be ageist. You know what I mean? But at some point, your cognitive abilities. Or if nothing else, yeah. just your old man bubble or old yeah. woman bubble will keep you from understanding what the needs of the of the the younger yes. movement. The and I don't want to use the word progressive because that's going to sound like I'm taking a position left or right, and I'm not. But but you grew up in a different era, mm-hmm. and you see things a different way. And America's not. I mean, how what's our average age? Do you know? Like uh, if it's nationwide, like what's the predominant? The hard you know part I mean? with like, that is because are we an of older, suicide. Are we an aging older, population? Or are we? Uh, yeah, older. I mean, our, our average age has went down because of suicides and mental health things, and you know, like, but the, but the, and that skews it, right? COVID. But you know, for early American history and especially our founding fathers' generations, the body gave out before the mind. 
now we're in a situation with medical advances where sometimes the mind gives out before the body. And we have all these mental diseases, Alzheimer's, and diabetes is now a thing because of our diets. And like there's so much more that can affect our brain because we're living past any cognitive prime. I mean, you know, when, when people were expected to die at 60. Cognitive yeah, prime. I like that I like wording. That. Um, so 38 is the average age of our population. And our life expectancy is 79. What's the average age of our representatives? Uh, uh. 105. <laughs> <laughs> Collectively, Old. dinosaurs. Yeah, the baby boomers aren't giving it up. That's the thing. This is the first generation that's hung on this long. Maybe because they could, um, you know, but the baby boomer generation still dominates our government. Medicare. <laughs> Maybe so. It's that free government stuff. Yeah. I, well, you know, this is something we talk about. We we always talk about the the age requirements and should there be a cap in AP Gov. But what's so interesting right now is we're studying in AP Comparative Nigeria who took our constitution basically in 1999 and went, hey, what did they screw up and how can we fix it? And one of the things they did, uh, for specifically the Supreme Court is where they have it, but it's a 70-year, you can't be over 70 and serve on their Supreme Court. <laughs> um, so I, I do think at some point we're going to have to consider that. Uh, the average age of the 117th Congress was 60 years old. And the average age for the America... Uh, 38. 38. Ah. So, so nice. close. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not. <laughs> wow. How and are you truly representing Leonardo. America if you're... I mean, again, nothing against... I'm not trying to be... Right? I'm not like... Down with old people. Go away, because I'm about to... Yeah, you know, because I'm, I'm edging on those numbers myself. But but they're making laws based on technology that they don't even know mm-hmm. what is going on. What is a Facebook? You yes. Know, they, <laughs> like, literally. And, and our technology is it's exploding exponentially. I just read uh, that Tristan Harris that did The Social Dilemma, I think, on Netflix. You know, he just revealed that the top 20... Christian Facebook sites, 15 are ran by bots. Like this is, we're we're in kind of a cyber war and Black Lives Matter too. Many of the top most popular Facebook sites for Black Lives Matter are created and ran by bots. Now our algorithms can still detect that, but next week they might not be able to detect what's different between a bot and a human. They might act so similarly online. And and so like other countries, no, they're not going to go head to head with our military, but it's Sun Tzu, turn them on themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we're having that happen. And we have 80-year-old congressmen calling Mark Zuckerberg in, trying, well, what, do you, what role do you think Facebook has? You know, it's, it's such a generation gap. And I think young we people that an, understand. We're such an aging empire. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. We are. We are. You know, we've seen this in history. <laughs> um, you teach about it constantly. It's, it's, it's coming. But We can reinvent ourselves. Yeah, we don't have to fall apart. Are we going to be right. the the Great but, Britain of next the next, you know, in fifty years? So politically or, divided right now. I don't know. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it, it it as we started to say at the very top though, it has been very much of a different mood this school year. Not just because a lot of the mandates are lifted and we're not all mask up one hundred percent of the time, although that could change. Um, but the vibe is definitely different politically. Like, it's just, and you know, obviously there's still people screaming at their TVs and, you know, they're mad about everything. But I feel less stressed about politics. Uh, you know, say what you want about Trump. And I think there's going to be good that comes out of all this. He's polarizing. Whatever was wrong, he made worse. Uh, and you could say, well, it wasn't him. Well, what the reaction to him. Well, it was him because he was attempting to make it worse. Right. Like that was he wasn't a alleviating it. mediator, you know, de-escalation of no. tensions. He ramped well, everything no. up. No, so, go back and listen to his uh, his uh, inaugural speech, you know, yeah. darkest days of man kind of scenario. I so mean, say what you want to about Biden, but he's not on TV yelling and saying crazy stuff that makes things much worse. People believe what they already believe. He does seem to be, he's just floating along trying to, th- I think, seem cognitively, you know, there. Um, <laughs> and I'm not, you know, talk about not inspiring. You know, Biden's not the most inspiring mm. political leader. Well, they but, started putting some of these uh, uh, January 6th boys in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the Viking guy with the painted face, I can't think of his name, but he just got his term set and uh, several other. I mean, they're still going down the list. Yeah, they who's are. the Who's the boy? Is it Mark Meadows that just decided to um, mm, cooperate with yeah. investigators? Comply with the subpoenas, yeah. yeah. So who's he again? 
remind the people? Can um, remind me? Because I know his name, but he was associated he was, with Trump, but I can't remember his role. Yeah, he was... Mm. Uh, was he chief of staff? I want to say he was chief of staff. Chief of staff, Mark Meadows. There you go. That yeah. sounds right. Isn't it funny? Like it, last year at this time, we could name everybody in Trump's cabinet. And never, <laughs> yeah, so and oh, I know, we, right? We tried to forget. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, but the and uh, the revolving door. Of, oh yeah. yeah. The other media thing, and this is something that just popped up a day or so ago. And that's why his name's on my mind. I guess is that he uh, revealed <laughs> that uh, during the uh, during one, the debate between uh, Trump and Biden that Trump had been diagnosed with uh, COVID just before and went yeah, ahead with the debate anyway. Mm-hmm. He asking him, and he's like, no, no, that's not true. But then, you know, he had the whole go to the hospital episode. Right. So, yeah. My kids are about to do their mock presidential debate, and we were talking about that today. Yeah. Um, one of them brought up, well, Trump had COVID before he is, and they're all looking at each other like, <laughs> so that was funny, uh, timing-wise anyway. But, yeah, he was revealed that three days before, I think it was, he tested positive. Now, I know that Trump is an anom- anomaly in our modern politics, but, you know, not long ago I taught about Jackson. And every time I teach about Jackson, I think, you know, that guy right there, I mean, a whole party formed based on the hatred of Jackson. He threatened to hang his own vice president. Like, that guy said some things, too, that people were going like, Well, there's a similarity there because Trump was willing to stand by and let his yeah, vice president yeah, that's right, yeah. Trump hung Jackson's portrait in the Oval Office. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, Jackson's an interesting figure, too, when you look back at the politics of that day. And, you know, we got through it at least for a while <laughs> until Civil War. <laughs> um, okay. So let's switch gears. I've got – we're getting towards the ho- – it's the holiday season. Yeah, da, 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 da. Um, so let's do some more lighthearted things here as we end. I, I, I threw a question. Andy Williams? Is that what you were doing there? I have no idea what that I is. That, I think that's who that was. <laughs> he did. I did hear him. He's not still alive, is he? Uh, maybe. I uh, don't I have no idea. Andy, Andy, Andy with he, the phone. Andy Check that out real quick. Yeah, we're Andy gonna, Williams. We're Googling that because uh, I don't want to say if, if he is still alive, he is up there. But he did a lot of the Christmas classics, and then he had a place in Branson. Most wonderful time of it's year. It's the most. That. Yeah. He died 2012. Oh, did he? Okay. okay. He well, seemed well, like yeah. we've missed that. Sorry about that. We, I probably knew it at the time. Right. Somebody, somebody, stuff we a, knew we forgot. Some friend of mine, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Some friend of mine posted a thing the other day. And it was like, uh, oh, it was a uh, Sean Connery. They're like, oh my god, Sean Connery just died. And I was like, holy crap. And then I'm like, no, wait a minute, Sean Connery's already dead because I remember him going around at the same time that Alex Trebek did. Because I, I don't know why I remember those two things nearly back to back, but I did. And but they were like, it's just, and I'm like, no, it did. but that's how quickly I had sort of compartmentalized oh, it and let it go. That I was freshly oh about it, dude. I'm telling <laughs> you, at least once a week now, I, I will say, "Is that guy still alive?" Or is that girl? And I will Google because I'm like, I'm at the age now where people yeah. that I grew up with are dying of yeah. old age, and but, I think, uh, and 20, I, they they've been out of the spotlight for ten 2012? years. 2012, like yeah. he went down with the Mayans. <laughs> yeah, apparently, uh, who knew? Oh, I guess they did. <laughs> 2012, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't heed that warning. Uh, but uh, you know why? You know why I think though. That it doesn't seem like he's gone is because it's Christmas time and I yeah. hear his voice all the time and he's they still put his face on I think Branson commercials and he's like oh it's wonderful time you know he does the yeah, yeah I mean it still yeah. seems like he's here right yeah and well, maybe, that's, maybe that is a, a weird sort of <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird sort of longevity Frank Sinatra what about him <laughs> um, anyhow so it's coming now I did say uh, I threw a question I, let's see if y'all know I threw a question to them right before we started and. Um, I think they were pumping the brakes, but let's see. I ask you, you guys to reveal something that you find either interesting or you've been fascinated with in your past that maybe you haven't talked a lot about on the podcast or to the students. Did you think of something? I, well, I, I took it a different direction when you were saying what 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 is it. Uh, you, I think one of the ways you said it was what's something that you wish was taught that's generally not. And oh, yeah. it's, most, it's most of what we teach f- to our sophomores because they're so I don't know weirdly isolated in their own you know it's oh it's it's America first and all that and okay fine I'm I'm good with patriotism but we our students don't have a great knowledge of things outside of our system and they don't have a great knowledge of our system well, that's yeah, something you, we're working on I would yeah. both know that more than me but they don't know it just seems like you know I wish and I, I'll go back to my own experience like nobody taught me about Asia nobody taught me about Africa nobody taught me about South America really nobody even taught me about Canada I mean I those things I've learned on my own as an adult 
and especially now that we teach it, you know, world history. But when I was a kid, world history, and I've actually complained about this in class to my kids, I had to learn this stuff so I could teach it to you. Like I, but in a world history class, I'm sitting in a high school class, world history, it was America and some Europe, you know, World War II, and that's pretty much all we got. Maybe, maybe I think one teacher threw a Gandhi film at us once, you know. Ben Kingsley, okay, so that's all I knew about Gandhi. <laughs> he looked a lot like Ben Kingsley. Uh, but, okay, but that's a... We, we're global citizens. How can we right. do that if we don't know our position with inside that, you know, what are, what are our proximities? Uh, so that's, those are things that I work to try to fix, you know, because yeah. it, it, I shouldn't have had to have learned that as an adult. And somebody got paid good money not to teach me those things that I should have known. Like my, well, o- my only knowledge of Africa when I was growing up was like Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, and mm-hmm. there they are out in the Serengeti you know, chasing another uh, uh, elephant down and, and watching the giraffes well, run. That's some all of, I knew. That's all I knew. Some of that could go back to Sputnik and the ch- – like, because I think probably that happened because your teachers didn't know it either. Yeah, but and it takes a teacher not, to go know, out and learn it. Like you went out and learned it. Excuse though. No, well, I'm not saying it's a good excuse. I'm saying I bet the teachers you had didn't know about Africa either. Right? They're no, not going to go well, out there and learn you it. That if I had asked them, they wouldn't be like, I don't know. Well, we'll look that up someday, but they wouldn't. I, yeah. I don't think that anybody held them accountable to know it. I don't think anybody mm-hmm. held them to push them to try to expand that out. Good enough. And I, I think I don't know about your history experiences in high school, especially. But I think there was a lot of, I mean... My world history was Western European history. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't world history yeah. at all. So. I mean, if I get... Okay, cool. U.S. history, I get that. But world history, like, we probably mm-hmm. need to talk about some other people. It's a big planet. And not just Europe. Right. And the ancient yeah. Greeks and Romans. Yeah. It's but like you know, ancient Greek, Rome, Europe. But we still have this propensity to do that because if you watch world news tonight with whatever channel is doing that, right. they will talk about the United States and maybe, maybe a flood somewhere somewhere else. Oh, an earthquake in Japan. Yeah. Anybody know where Japan is? Well, we could probably find it on a map if we tried real hard. I mean, there, I, saw, I read a thing the other day that said for years and years, the globe that was spinning on one of the major networks, news channels, their world news thing, the world was spinning in the wrong direction. <laughs> I heard that too. <laughs> so this is how much we care about the rest of the world, apparently. <laughs> so, I mean, part of it's you know, media saturation of just everything us. And like I said, I'm not nothing against us. That's not what I'm saying. But we are not, we don't live in a vacuum, you know, and we shouldn't have that mentality. So anyway, that's my big thing. I think a large part of that, too, is our culture spreads globally, but other countries' culture doesn't spread naturally here. Like, we don't listen to German music very much, obviously, or Italian or Indian music. I think that's changed a bit, though. It might have now. It has a little. I I agree. But like movie stars and TV shows, and they're, 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 you know, it's, Global people in Spain watch American TV shows constantly. We're just now seeing on Netflix some Korean yeah, yeah. shows. No, I, yeah, some, I agree. That's what I'm saying. Know, I, think so, yeah. I think it's slow to change, but I think, I'm, but you're seeing some movement in that direction to see yeah. other people's cool stuff. Well, that's what I was. We were talking just before the podcast. My AP comparative kids were about to watch some Nollywood, which is Nigerian Hollywood stuff. When we and we're going to eat some Nigerian food, we're going to listen to some Nigerian music, and I really do think we should be expansive in that. Um, and but yeah. isn't it like a isn't it weirdly Western for us to call it Nollywood? They named it that. I know. Well, but, but it, yeah, but, but, but again, but still, but it still has a Western. Yeah, it shows the because, well because movies. Sure. I mean, we did create the movie industries. Yeah. In New York and Hollywood. Right. Which, by the way, and I'm sure you know this, but maybe people out there don't. When Hollywood Land was first created, mm-hmm. it was like private ownership, and it was yep. supposed to be like this new utopia. And they had big signs on the outside of the city limit said "No actors allowed." <laughs> <laughs> Stay out, you you hoodlum ruffian. I mean, you know, because. Actors didn't have great reputation historically. They weren't considered right, quality yeah. people. You know, sure. you're acting for a living. That's not work. What are you doing? Now we elect them president. And now, <laughs> and now, see, that's where <laughs> I was going. You beat me to it. <laughs> you stole my thunder, man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, go, I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry with your Nollywood. Oh, no, I was just saying, I, you know, I agree. I think the we have to branch out. And we. I, I had a good world history teacher as – in high school, but I was one of the few. And I do remember talking about South America and Africa, but not in the extent that you or I teach it mm-hmm. at, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you fix to get the full story. You come in here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean, also, as best, as, as best well, we can. As, with time allowed. Time, yeah. yeah. Um, I think what I would, I, I was talking with one of my classes the other day. 
And I got uh, the question of if you could teach us something not in this curriculum and it was gov, what would you teach? And I said, em- employment law. Like, what can your employers do and what can you do? Mm-hmm. And uh, what is the disciplinary process and how far can it go? And wh- what do they have to tell you and what do they not? And I think that real world, we need to be telling kids what it's what like in the workplace. Um, and, and how, if and, you suck, they'll get rid of you. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't show up, they'll get rid of you. And if you don't do things on time and deadlines, they'll get rid of you. Yeah. And I made it a point to tell them that the government works a little bit differently than private business. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I do think that that's something that they should know about and labor laws and, and they have no clues about and it. Safety law. I mean, safety. Yeah. yeah. Um, now probably the weirdest thing that I de- ever did a deep dive in, I was thinking about this and I, I I hate criminal law, by the way. Let me just put that out there first. I always hated it in law school. It was always my worst class is criminal and law and you criminal did, procedure. Why did you not like it? I just didn't enjoy it. It wasn't the subject I liked. Okay. I liked constitutional law, which has, I mean, fourth, you know, uh, fourth, fifth, sixth amendment, stuff like that. But um, the detail and, you know, the model penal code and all the standards, I was just like, this is so tedious. But when we studied the Twinkie defense... Oh, I'm, I'm high is, on sugar. That is the one that stuck with me. Do you know that, this? Yeah. Hang on. I, that sounds familiar, but you might have to explain it to me. Uh, recently elected, he was the first openly gay commissioner in San Francisco. Really, probably the first openly gay man elected in America at any major office. Harvey, Harvey Milk. Milk. Yeah, there you go. Okay, was, uh, now I'm, it's coming. Yeah, as assassinated by his own coworker, uh, his own uh, city council member Dan White, who had been a fireman, um, really in shape, um, staunch. I think he was Catholic. I may be wrong about that. Was very religious, and he was very upset that Harvey Milk, openly gay man, is. Mm-hmm. You know, with him working as- alongside him, he was uh, a little threatened by the. I think so. and By the working relationship? Yeah, and they, you know, get a little crossways. And he, as Dan assassinates Harvey Milk. And at trial, he claimed what's now infamously known as the Twinkie defense, that he got depressed and that he stopped eating his normal healthy foods and working out. And he started eating a lot of junk food and Twinkies, and the Twinkie made him do it. Twinkies are filled with testosterone, <laughs> and it made uh, me crazy. And really... It's, I mean, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it the Twinkie defense, but I, that, what do you call it after that? But it was really a depression. I wonder if Hostess fought back against that. <laughs> yeah. A file suit, yeah. Please don't call um, that. It's really the idea that depression made him mm-hmm. that way. But the junk food. But the junk food made stuck. Him yeah, they made, he gave testimony about what he had been eating. And of course, you know, you say Twinkies, and it's going to be the Twinkie defense. Um, but then, you know, that goes down okay, the road. Okay, so I don't hole. know the end of that. Did he? Did it work? Oh, no, did it, it did work? not work. It okay. did not work. <laughs> <laughs> if the Twinkie defense worked, I might have left law school. If you, I'm <laughs> if you go back and look at old school Twinkie boxes, the Twinkie is a cowboy with pistols. It, it's true, yeah. With a cowboy oh, hat, wow. and he was like, shoot him up, baby. And so maybe that's where, maybe in his depressive state, he hallucinated that the Twinkie <laughs> saw cowboy. The Twinkie man. <laughs> <laughs> so before violent video games, yeah. there was the Twinkie. <laughs> Cowboy. But I went down like a rabbit hole of how is that a thing? I remember in law school, of course, I, that was like 2003, so the internet was still in its infancy, and so you couldn't find all, all that much oh, about yeah. it. But every few years, there's a new weird defense that intrigues me. Like, uh, who is that a few years ago? Oh, the was rich the, teenager. The, the affluenza. affluenza. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every once in a while, you'll get one of the. I'll be like, I really want to know about that. Like, weird criminal law defenses is probably my... Yeah, I bet that goes along with like the weird constitutional laws that are still oh, on yeah. the books. That kids like to find those and bring those up, you know. Hey, what about you? Um, to me, when I think about what high school kids should know that they don't know, it's all it's usually about money. Mm-hmm. I, I just think debt, credit, financing, not financing, paying with cash, piracy, <laughs> maybe Bitcoin. <laughs> like, there's so much I don't know, you know. Um, and I wish I'd knew at their age, but like. Don't ruin your credit at 22. Don't go into so much debt. You have no freedom. I, I tell the kids that. Y'all hear that a lot. I think also something that school becomes their world and relationship advice to let students know that this is not all there is, <laughs> that you don't have to settle down with someone when you're in high school. And I, I think people stay in relationships that are so destructive and toxic and they don't even know it. And there's nothing we really offer 
that teaches them how to break up with someone or how to know if you're in a toxic relationship. I think that kind of service how for students. How to know if you're in a toxic relationship. <laughs> yeah, they don't know. Or in a toxic Next workplace. Next week on History After Hours. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be the person, but... <laughs> yeah, well, we don't want to do it. Um, but, but it'd be no, nice. I, I mean, I know we have you. counseling services, and a lot of that is maybe geared toward something else. And I'm sure they, they talk about that stuff, too. But enabling our students to be independent and not have to get into a relationship that might be abusive mentally or physically, not even know they're in that. And, you know, 10 years later, they're, who knows how that messes you up. So I mean, Franklin's right though. The work goes alongside because you, there's a relationship with your work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my work with my work as an attorney and in politics became toxic. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to know when to leave those sort of things. Did you realize I have a problem? Like, (laughs) Um, is there like a ex lawyer twelve step program you had to go through? Is it? <laughs> well, you know, desensitize and you turn your desk thing, over. Of, <laughs> my, of my group of friends that were, I was that my close group of friends I was in law school with. There's only one still practicing. Oh wow! Hmm. And that is an insane. I, and not that I have a huge group of friends, but eight or nine, and there's one still practicing. Um, All get out for similar reasons. Yeah, it's you know it's 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 corrupt for, for a lot of it. If you worked in government or politics, um, it's disheartening, uh, and sad if you worked on the side of government services. Like so the I one person who DHS. stayed embraced the corruption. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing great. No, I just, he's a good guy. I'm not gonna, not gonna, you know, but you have to, I think it's a, an important point to, to recognize what's toxic and what's making it toxic. My health was horrible. Um, you turn into someone you don't like. Um, I've talked to you guys about that before, like flipping the lawyer switch. You've seen it maybe once mm-hmm. or twice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. It's not me by any stretch. And at some point it did physically affect my health. And I think, you know, relationships do that too. Personal relationships, mm-hmm. work relationships, and kids do need to hear about them and know, uh, that there are options and, and how to leave. I agree. Yeah. I, I tell you, um, when I coached, you know, after a few years of coaching, thinking that would be the perfect job for me, uh, you know, when I'm yelling all the time, when I can't sleep at night because I'm just constantly thinking about how do I get these 16-year-olds to play mm-hmm. better? You know, it's just like, am I? But I fell in love with history. And I had a great mentor, Mr. Bill Remo, who I've mentioned a million times, who took me on trips, got me interested in traveling, got me interested in history. And it took me down a different path. Thank goodness I had that outlet and I didn't just quit, you know, that I could shift well, okay, in my so own profession. Let's, let's do a hypothetical. Like, where would you have gone if you had not found, if you had not discovered this part of the job? Like, where do you think you'd be? I, I think I would have tried... Probably if I, if it, if I'd have left early enough, I would have went back music. to try to farm. Really? Yeah, I, I'm not. As much I'm not you, a risk. As much as you have complained about farming, <laughs> yep. I'm not a risk taker. Yeah. If I was a risk taker, I would try music. Um, but I'd probably be a branch manager at a whatever. Uh, you know, I think I'm I'm organized. I'm on time. I'm whatever. So I, I've got skills that I could use in other arenas. Maybe personal training. At that point, maybe personal training, because I did toy with that at the time. Like I could leave this coaching, but I could go own a gym, or I could – I'd have probably went fitness, as a matter of fact, thinking back now. But I'll tell you another thing I think that I wish our students know, knew, and not even our students as much as our students' parents. This will probably get me in trouble. But um, I'll cut this out if I think so. <laughs> but um, that they don't – they're not a loser if they don't go to college. And that sometimes on counsel, not not our counselors, but I remember I had a counselor at school. This all started in the 90s and early 2000s. And there was a poster and it was a a mechanic that had grease on them. And then next, and he looked miserable. And next to it um, was a college graduate with a diploma and looked all happy. Which one, which career do you want? Mm. And it was that whole selling of this white collar, you got to go to college push, right? No child left behind. We're all going to college. Which, which was ultimately a scheme to funnel money into, uh, into universities. Like Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's really what that was. And in reality, everybody's going to go to college. Why? So colleges can make more money. Oh Yeah. yeah. And that, and that, my friend, is when the prices started to skyrocket because it's tuition it? increase. In the time from the time I went to college the first time, because I've been multiple times now, 
to the time I went back to get my teaching degree, like the price had jumped like 900%. Oh, it's mm. insane. Yeah. It's insane, yeah. Well, and I've been, I, this will probably get me in trouble. I've been talking with my students now about, you know, when we rolled back the foreign language requirements, what is what I feel we need to tell students is if you want to go out of state, most out of state requirements for admission are foreign languages, at least one or two credits. And some seniors are finding that out the hard way. Mm. Um, and look, I'm, I, the State Department... Arkansas Department of Education and and no longer making those requirements. They're keeping people in Arkansas. And I'm not saying it's malicious. I'm not saying it's intentional. It but sounds purposeful. It, I mean, it lowers. It's not like they don't know that. Right. Yes. Yeah. That And that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah and but, but that poster I was talking about, about the mechanic looking all bad, like that person maybe loves that job sense of rewarding and purpose and they make a lot of money and if you look at right. that guy holding the degree that degree might be worthless because you literally could spend 60 grand on a degree and not use it mm-hmm. like a degree is only like i use my degree thankfully but a lot of people spend i've got friends i've got friends that are my age in their 40s and owe thousands of dollars in unforgivable student debt not doing anything that's related to what the degree they didn't have to get the degree they couldn't they didn't have to pay any of that money and they'd still be doing the same so, job they so are so maybe i need to amend my statement to the money was being funneled to institutions but one of the institutions that's being funneled to is the lo- lending mm-hmm. in- yes. industry Y'all know how Reagan ties into this? Well, <laughs> we'll get to that. No more protesting. But, no, honestly, if I if if I didn't have uh, AP Gov and if I weren't doing mock trials and if I weren't um, doing that part of it, I would feel that way exactly because that's that's where my law degree comes in best, and the kids right. always do amazing on that. But and on this podcast, <laughs> well, we ask yeah. you a million questions, <laughs> but. Uh, but I would feel that way. I, I mean, I don't feel that way, and I don't regret studying law, but, you know, that's where they get the best of me. Right. Yeah, and uh, just think about how many people you know that have a degree in something, a lot of business degrees, that they're not, they didn't need that to do what they're doing, mm-hmm. or they've went a completely different direction, or they changed majors 10 times, and it's like, like, why are you in college again? Like, don't just jump into college to find out what you want to do. You might do that, and if it's paid for, maybe. But find out what you want to do before you start spending a bunch of money on I'm college. proud that we're working hard to get ROTC on campus. Me yes, too. Yes. We, we have been talking like about that. that for more than a decade. They're finally, it looks like we're finally going to do it. Uh, bravo to all the people who are working to make that happen. Like I, yep. I'm That'll ex- be a great I'm excited about that. Cause vocational. We, well, you, you, you did your, your statistical thing. Like you had some yes. interesting yeah, we statistics. Had, we we put it on the yeah. AP Gov poll. Um, you know, we did our AP Gov poll on local school issues this year, um, and the class w- wanted to work with Mr. Brunet, and he asked uh, that we put some questions on there. Um, uh, two of them are important. One directly to us, an African American history class. Two ROTC, Air Force ROTC, and both have strong support. Um, there, are, just for Air. Air Force ROTC, there's a 25% active interest in it. Mm -hmm. And that's over, I mean, we have a population of 1,053 students. That's huge. And even if they aren't, even if they don't go through, not if everybody goes into that program, uh, if you have a quarter interest, that's big. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those were great numbers. Um, And the interest in African-American history was a third of, uh, of the respondents, people who were polled. And that's huge too. That is huge too. That it's 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 wonderful. And you know, we've got a minority population in Lakeside at about 26, 20, 26 and a half percent. Um, and the people who are interested in in the African American class, just under half of those people are minority students. I think they want um, representation, sort of so to speak. They, they want to see inclusion. That's a better word for it. They yeah. want to see inclusion. We, Not that we the, don't. Yeah, something. The only way that we have that like world directly is is the world classes. Yes, yeah, and because we do, and that goes back to what I was saying a while ago. Like we work double hard to make sure that we, because people go, well, you know, when are we going to talk about? Uh, when are we going to talk about black history? I'm like, black history is history. Like, it's not a separate thing. Yeah. I, right. so weird, I, I think it's weird when people say that. So, like, we we talk about all of these different cultures, and, of course, we have to do it through a timeline, and we have to hit each, you know, and then, but we also show how they blend and how they've touched on each other in every story, and then, you know, and then you round that out. And the AP world does a really good job of that. Your comparative stuff, talking about yep. multiple countries, you just brought up the Nigerian thing. Like, we're doing it. 
but there's not a standalone class that does that. And I right. think that'd be an interesting addition. I do too. I think it, I think it would be a good addition. Um, so I hope everything works out on that. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm really proud of of the department and and I'm proud of where we're headed with it. And I hope. I hope things good things come from it. It's one of the great benefits for you guys doing those surveys too. Oh yeah, actual hard data. You know, I'm going to pat my kids on the back for a minute. They they polled hand polled 450 kids in less than 45 minutes, and we still had a and uh, amazingly accurate. Yes, your, your your margin of error was really the small. The margin of error was four percent. The de- demographic sample was perfect on all but two, and only one group was underrepresented in the. Um, group that was overrepresented was uh, um, a multiple minority, so the, it's still a representative population. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the da- the data is really sound. Um, they worked really hard, and they found out how hard it is to actually do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Not opinion <laughs> polls. No, no, no. Like, Actual like, hard like just data. just man on the street. How do you feel about No, no, no it wasn't that. Scientific, mm-hmm. yeah. stratified <laughs> samples. And writing questions that aren't biased, yeah. counting them. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes when you hear the word survey, people go, "Oh well, no, this is no, no these we, are like real. This is scientifically we were pollsters. Yeah, this yeah. is that's awesome. Hard hard data. I'm really proud of them. Yeah. And something I'd like to add to that, maybe next year, because I just thought of it, just a little more work for you and sure, your students. But, <laughs> but our trips that we take, like we're going to Italy and Greece, and this, I want to always say, if you, these are experiences that a lot of students don't get a chance to do. Any of these countries we go to are awesome, but it would be interesting to to give a list of countries, you know, pick top three countries you'd like to visit as a historic. Now, once again, we're history teachers. We do historic trips. So, you know, that, that doesn't, and there's some countries that aren't safe to go to and feasible. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, we could open up the umbrella of countries. You know, I try to always hit uh, Great Britain and France and Italy in some fashion and we're going to Greece this year and we've done central Europe and some, you know, Poland and things like that. But we talked about Morocco once before. Uh huh. Yeah. There's a Spain and Morocco. Morocco. That's a great trip. So EF has like these groups, these uh, trips all kind of combined. It'd be nice to put maybe, maybe 10 of them and let students pick their top three. Or I know that would be a different kind of thing, but you know what I mean? Just get more interested. What students around here, if they could go anywhere, because these trips are a lot cheaper doing it through us than it would be to go and by yourself. Yeah. Um, and it could be life-changing. I mean, it usually is life-changing for these students. Now, I know we have some very privileged students that have traveled to Europe several times already, but I always get students that's never been on a plane. You know, mm-hmm. they've never yeah. they've never experienced any of this, and that's why I keep doing it. Didn't we have didn't we have a few years ago a kid who'd never been out of the city? <laughs> we had somebody that didn't seems like they're at least out of the state. Yeah, I think maybe the state never had been out of the state. And you know that opens up your mind to all sorts of different cultures and the way, and it could change just the way you think about everything. You know that because you do get lost in our little culture, like you were saying. You don't learn about other cultures because this is all you got right here, and it's not readily available on TV and the radio and the Amera bubble. The Amera <laughs> bubble. Yeah. Okay, let's end it on this note. Uh, I've got a list of the most influential toys ever created. I grabbed this from the first website I came across, right. so I don't know how... Uh, are you saying ever? Ever. Okay. Well, I don't know. It just says most, okay. most influential toys. All right, I'm gonna, so we're I'm not... Gonna, we're, well, hey, let me, I'm going to guess. We're taking modern day, though, so we're not going oh. back to ancient Egypt toys. That they might have, <laughs> um, what were the ancient Egypt toys? Stick and rock. I was about to say... <laughs> Okay, so guess... Let's see where, where uh, we land in the top. I've got 12 or 13. I'm going to say... Um, Oh, toys or games? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is it video games too? No, it's just mm. toys. Board games? No board games. Just okay. toys? Just, to- just oh. toys like that you would play with. There's a one... Uh, well, I don't want to give slinky. it away. Slinky. It seems like every kid had a slinky. Everyone loves a slinky. Is that on uh, the list? Number 11. Ooh. Invented right. in 1943. Right in the right. middle of World War II. We had to give them something to play with. <laughs> oh, you, wet metal the, object. You know, boys Use it the, for the war. <laughs> war. Hey, it is. there is a use for it in the war. They used them for uh, uh, service antennas on the radios. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah man. There you go. That's why they somebody right. found it could go down some steps, yeah. and there you have Spring it. Bring that thing out there. You got yourself a nice little... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> okay, anyway. So that makes sense. The yeah. date makes sense. So yeah, it's number 11. Toys. It can, it's so not like action figures or No, anything. it could be, yeah. It could be action figures. Oh, like G.I. Joe as well. G.I. Joe I throw, I throw is, a Barbie out there to go along with G.I. Joe. Oh, yeah. You know what's crazy is I didn't... Barbie's not in the top list. I, that's the first really? thing I thought of wow. was Barbie. Like, and, isn't that the first like major... Yeah. 
Um, so once again, this website that wow. I used, I didn't do. I just the first one I saw. I just I just wanted to see it. The list came up. I Isn't just, that one of the most popular toys ever? I would seriously think so. so. I would think so for real. It was. Now <clears throat> my granddaughter's two. I think I mentioned that a while ago. She's already got like several. Bar- she got. She loved Barbie. Well, how about this GI Joe? That was that you said is number nine, and the reason they did it, it was Barbie for boys. That's what they called it. Well, then, but Barbie's not on the list. So Barbie's, but <laughs> Barbie's on, not on the website, list. whatever yeah. you were. But 1963, well, you, hear, you know how they list. marketed G.I. Joe to boys? They called them action figures. Yep. It ain't a doll, it's an mm-hmm. action figure. Yeah. And, and they made their elbows bend. Yeah, and yeah. Their, yeah. yeah. Where right, Barbie, yeah. they're all, they can't bend, and right. so you can have more action with these toys. I, I guess had, that's... They, okay, here's a, here's a little side note on that. There was a moment in American history when G.I. Joe went away. Vietnam era. Er, uh, early to mid-70s, you couldn't, nobody wanted them. Yeah. Because there was such wow. a disdain for all things militaristic because of the f- debacle that we'd been in and all of the struggle and strife. And, and, and that pissed off a lot of people who were on the more you know, hardcore patriotic at all costs scenario uh, bandwagon. But there was like, the people just weren't buying war toys for their kids. And G.I. Joe actually went away because I remember because I'm older than y'all, I had, it was like a, I don't know, he was like eight to 10 inch, like, I mean, he was G.I. Joe, full green jacket. It was like World War II version, you know? Yep. And, but, and then, but all of a sudden, everything was gone. You could, you didn't see it in the stores, like at all. And then in 1980 and 81, when Reagan gets into office, G.I. Joe came back. Mm-hmm. There was like a return jacked, to military. I bet. Have y'all yeah, seen the was, But they were, they were those smaller plastic mm-hmm. dudes, about three inch high, and they, but they were like, Beefed up. I yeah. mean, it's like super soldier. Schwarzenegger kinda. did his and they had job. Their own, they had their own cereal. They had their own Saturday morning cartoon show. Yeah. It, so it came back, but there was, but it was a, but there was a moment in our history where it wasn't popular. Hmm. Anyway, so this is based on influence, and I'm wondering with the growing population in world, it's worldwide. I Legos wonder if that has. Yeah, that's what Legos. I don't see them. What? what? Lincoln crazy. Logs. Yeah, Lincoln Logs. No, it's got guy, Rubik, yes. Rubik's, Rubik's Cube. Rubik's Cube is number four. Yeah, okay. And once that. again, I, and now that that's I'm a, looking at this list, I'm thinking. Yeah. But the first funny. talking portable doll, I've never heard of this. This is the one on the list I've never heard. Chatty Cathy. Oh, yeah. 1959. I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. That was the first portable that said re- repeating phrases and, mm-hmm. you know, kids. Um, something you might not think of Easy Bake Oven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, Didn't that was that. not 60s. The Bake number one. Brownies. Number one, I'll give you a hint, 1980s, a doll in the 80s that every... It was the first doll where each of them looked different. Cabbage Patch? Cabbage, Cabbage Patch. Patch. That's what they have as the number one doll. I don't know, man. It was not yeah. tied... It was the first one not tied to a TV show. It yeah. was its own... Hmm. Thing, they had a, they had a uh, they had a punk version of that like an anti cabbage patch. It was called the Garbage Pail Kids. Do you ever see the Garbage oh, Pail yeah, Kids? Oh yeah, I remember they were, that. They, ooey gooey Louie and all this stuff. <laughs> they had their own <laughs> trading cards and things. So there's Play Doh and Yo Yo. Play Doh, yeah. Yo Yos, um, Hula Hoop, Hula Hoop. That's Star what was, Wars yeah. figurines. Yeah. So I should known Star Radio Wars. Radio Flyer wagon, Mel's red wagon. Oh, oh yeah. what a red wagon. Yeah. Okay, so there's that. Now, last thing <laughs> for the nostalgia. Yeah. Last thing for Christmas, what was the best Christmas toy? If What's the first one that jumps out that your parents got you, you'd been begging, boom, you get it. Whether, you know, I always think when I'm real young, it could have been when you were a little bit older. What's a Christmas toy that stands out to you? Do you or do you, can you remember one? It's not really a toy. I got a go-kart mm. one Christmas. Oh, man. That's yeah, a great that's one. A yeah, one. Yeah, and I was, well, okay. I was 42 I was, years old. <laughs> was, uh, last year. The wife got it for me. <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, I, I, had, I had, they used to have these big catalogs that would come out. Mm-hmm. Like Sears and Roebuck would have like yeah. a thick voluminous, uh, you know, uh, catalog. And you'd flip through it. And of course, you got to get past the crap for the moms and yes, the dads. Yes, toward the know, back. house stuff. And then, but it was like toys. Toys. Like 80 pages of toys. Mm-hmm. And in the very, very back, they had like bigger stuff. And there was like this go-kart. And I remember just like, oh, Freaking go kart, man! Because they wouldn't let me have a motorcycle. Yeah. They wouldn't let me have a motorcycle. My dad had a really bad probably experience wise. with a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. My, mm-hmm. Probably, yeah, probably. Because, uh, and then he had a friend who lost a leg or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was. And so they're like, "You can't have one. They're too dangerous." Which is weird because they let me ride my friends, but they, but I couldn't have one. Uh, but I, so I was like, okay, maybe a go kart. And I actually remember asking, "Hey, look at this!" Uh, and they're like, "Ah, oh, it's too expensive, boy. Then you hurt yourself. No, no, no. You're not old enough. Whatever." And like, there it was. And I was like, <gasps> and it was awesome. And here's part of the reason why it was awesome. Like I drove that thing and drove that thing and drove that thing. I became like, I was like, I was like a 
like a NASCAR driver. I was like Indy <laughs> formula driver. I, that's how I kind of pictured myself. And there was a neighbor kid who lived across the street. I was, we were probably eh, fifth, sixth grade or so about that time. And there was a high school kid lived across the street from me. His name was Kevin Cox. Kevin Cox, if you're out there, like, I don't, I hope you're doing well. Cause this guy was like, it was in the, this was in like the seventies, man. And so he was like this long haired hippie thinking back, he was probably a stoner, but I don't know that. Sorry, Kevin, if you weren't, <laughs> uh, but he was like a grease monkey. You know, he, he was like a, he was a motorhead. He loved it's all things mechanical right now, and he lived right across the street from us. And he always riding motorcycles and he's always shirtless, you know, and he's like perpetual tan, that guy, you know, and I don't know if he went to high school or not, but he was that age. And, but he would work on our, like we had friends that had motorcycles or whatever, he would work on them for us. And he souped up my go-kart oh. <laughs> without my parents' knowledge. He bypassed the governor on it. This thing would do like 80 miles an hour. Mm. If we broke something, he would weld it back on. Like that that's, guy was our hero, man. That's so, awesome. That's I a great. I wonder what happened to him. But yeah, it's a good story. I wanted one forever and I never got oh, one. Oh, it was yeah, awesome. It was such freedom. And that's why I think that's why I like to drive, though, because I've talked about on these podcasts yep. before like, I'm really going to be pissed off when, they, when the self-driving cars come and I, they take away my steering wheel yeah. I've, I've loved driving since I was a little kid and that's I think that's part of the reason it was just like this exhilaration I love it yeah okay well I mean if we're see that's if we're counting video games it's it's the original Nintendo because I was like yeah. six and just went absolutely nuts NES yeah yeah, and the power pad and the duck hunt. I mean, just I mean, it was amazing. And we, mom was like, "It sounds like a herd of elephants," because the power pad mm-hmm. had the Olympics game, and we were like, "Pretend we're Olympics." It was <laughs> just nuts. Now, if it's not, if we're not counting video games, I, the year I got um, all the He Man stuff with Castle Grayskull. Oh yeah, that was a big deal. I was just just yep. loved that. Um, and my I second still- tier. Since you brought up a second tier, I'll give you mine. What, I was a huge, huge Star Wars. Kid, I love. We went to the theater, saw it originally several times, and I still remember that moment where it comes on the screen. It's like, oh, my life changed. I got like a combo pack: X Wing fighter and Tie fighter. So like the good guys and the bad guys. The, they were big ships. You could put the dudes in them. Can you talk about Star Wars figures a while ago? Mm-hmm. And I, and they made sound, and the things would pop, and it was just it was the cool. Those was, those were so cool. So aside from the go kart, like tier two, that's it. Hmm. All right, now how about you? My tier two is actually the Nintendo. I was a little mm-hmm. older than you, so it didn't affect me as much. But when I was about fifth grade, maybe fourth grade, something like that, the one, the present that always pops in my mind, and I think this is the name of it, a transformer named Metroplex, oh. because we collected at my my friend, me and my friends collected all the train. I had dirge, you know, we had all yeah. the crazy ones, and I. It was literally a race to see who could afford this giant city <laughs> transport. I was it's the city one. It's yes. the city one. I know that one. Metroplex. <laughs> it folded out to yes, a huge... I never and got it, it, but I remember it. It was expensive. It's all I think I got that Christmas. It's like <laughs> maybe for two Christmases in a row, they combined one present for me. Um, we and sold I remember your sister. I got it <laughs> and was just so happy. <laughs> um, but when I think about how happy I and excited I was about that... When now, when now that I have a daughter, when I like when I got when she got a hoverboard a couple years ago, and she just like I, it makes me think about me, you know, they freak out, you know, and I was thinking, man, what can I do to get that excited again? <laughs> I yeah. wish I had that excitement about things, as you know, that's kind of one of the things about Christmas that makes it magical. Is it is magical, you know? You got presents, you don't know what they are. You think the big ones are the good ones. Sometimes they're not. You know, it's it's all it's as a Santa coming down a tree. How does that work? It's it. You know, when you think about that time period, it is a. There's magical so much thing. stress on kids. Like, have I been good enough? Trying to yeah, go it's like you like well, they got to give you like some melatonin or something to go to bed that night. But no, no, you're jacked up on milk and sugar and cookies. You know, yeah. like and then you try to go to sleep. And you're Isn't that an interesting out. thing? How we have this. And, and, and I know a little bit about the, the German history of Christmas and how it kind of morphed into what we, yeah, it is yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. But it is funny how we also put that moral spin and like, you got to be good. He's got a list. <laughs> it's just like, what are we guilting kids into? <laughs> Jesus is watching and Santa is too. I know the hey, Jesus man. thing might not mean anything, hey, but it works. Santa. I've, I've got friends and relatives who did not let their kids believe in Santa. And I'm like, you are making your Ooh, life yeah. harder because it is a control factor. Yeah. And so I had a 10th grader the other day go, how did you know? And I'm Santa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <He's just> like, <laughs> yeah, when your kid misbehaves and you just go, Santa. <laughs> and they're like, they straighten up. Because, <laughs> yeah, the toys matter. What, and, would, uh, what would be something that you could receive now that you would be like, 
Oh, I mean, to get like that, I mean, give that know, scream, I'd, that excitement. I'd scream if somebody got me a new car or, you know, a house. Uh, it's all money based. <laughs> I'm trying to think the ability there's to no, levitate. Like, little, there's no gizmo <laughs> gadgety thing that you'd be like. So. Um, I mean, I, obviously musical instruments. I think about those things. I don't know that there's any. I'm one of those that when my wife or somebody, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want? I say, hey, mm. I'm good. Did either of you I guys have ever, parents who would be like one Playing off the other one, it's like my because my dad was this guy. He was like, "All right, I think if we've been good enough, I think we can open one present early." Oh yeah, and like mom, hey, this is like a week mm. before, and my mom would be like, "No, there's no way," and I'd be like, "Because ah, he would get us all worked up." Yeah, and then because everybody knew she was going to say no, and that was part of the. He, they knew that that was the gimmick, and every year we would go, <gasps> maybe this year, but never, no, no, it's not a thing. But I, so I did that with my kids too. Just yeah, to the one present. <laughs> hey <laughs> kids, I think we might on and she'd be like, "No, oh, oh sorry, kids." <laughs> Well, what people don't realize is Christmas is magical when you're young, and then it sucks <laughs> until you have children. Yeah, children, and not the not the babies. They don't know what's going on. But when they yes. get a little older and yeah. they understand a little bit about Christmas and gifts, and you get to be the yeah. sneaky around, you're the sneaky one. And now it's, yeah, it's funny again. The magic is back, and you're the magic. We would do a thing. We would put. We would take because we have a fireplace, and we would like. They would always leave the cookies and stuff out for whatever, and hope so. Okay, go to bed. And then as soon as we thought they were asleep, we'd stop in there and you know fill stockings or whatever. But then we would always like I took like a boot thing and I was like, I'd make sure that we had ash in the fireplace so I could go boot. And then we would sprinkle some out on the on the uh, on the hearth and around. Like so, it was his boot. Yeah, like yeah. he had stepped out. Nice. That, so just and they were like every year, every oh, year the way like <gasps> the ashes. <laughs> it was it was proof. It was I mean so then it became how long can we keep this going? Yeah. You know what I mean? How much can I lie to this child <laughs> and yeah, prove that's exactly right. I want them to believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fun though. Like put a sound yeah. on the roof. Well, but here okay. So yeah. here's my take on that. Because I know a lot of parents are like, ah, you can't believe you'd lie to your kids. Like, shut up. Like <laughs> this is <laughs> we lie to them all the time. <laughs> this is like there's enough time for your, you know. There's enough time to be cranky and pessimistic, and life is going to get hard soon enough. Like, what's the problem with having a little bit of magic and mystery in those early days? You know what I mean? Like, let's play with it as long as they were willing to play. Like, that was our that was well, our. Well, we lie to gig. our kids. Like, why do I have to clean my room? Uh, because if you don't, then you're going to be homeless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we lie, we make up lies all the time. The world economy <laughs> will collapse. It's on you, Junior. Yeah. So you know, it's not like parents don't lie to their children. I understand, you know, part of that, all that. But I, I do like the whole magical. I don't, th- I don't consider it lying. I think it's it's uh, misdirection. A little misdirection. Right? It's it's like ma- it's well, innocent. You go to a, do you go to a magic show and go? You're lying. Mm-hmm. No, it's yeah. it's an illusion. You get it. It's fun. It's the same kind of thing. It's escapist. It's a story. It's a movie. I don't, you know. Yeah, yeah it's a movie. It's that's yeah. We're kind of providing that. And if they believe a little too much, you could always back it off a little some, bit. Some you don't dra- have to spread the ash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's a little it's a little fun drama that we got going on. Big deal. Yeah, you and know? they'll just be mad at you for that one day when they find out that it's all. No, um, our kids. They'll never trust you. We guys. played it this way with ours because <laughs> because uh, our kids are about three or four years apart, and so when the older one figured it out. Because they'd be like, all right, now, come on, tell me the truth. And I'd be like, look, if you stop believing, he stops coming. It's as simple as that. So they're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, you know, they, they probably stretched a year further just to get, yeah. okay. So, but then when they were like, okay, come on. They're like, okay. Yeah. So, but then you're like, all right, don't ruin it for your brother. You can be part of the fun, too. <gasps> so yeah. now, oh, that's like, great. they're in on it, you know. So that was the way we played that. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, guys. Um, I hope you both have a great Christmas. I hope you get a new toy that you're <laughs> going to love. And uh, I guess this is the last uh, podcast for 2021. Wow. So the next time you will hear our voices, we'll be on the other side of Christmas, and we'll let you know how it goes. So goodbye.